is it about Chicago that brings out the diehard and the fearless nature in each of us? I'm Elizabeth Alfano. On this episode of Chicago Stories, saxophone player Frank Catalano tells us how he caught his big break, despite more than a few obstacles. Frank Catalano is just shy of 40. But to understand him in full, you have to go way back. Unlike most of us, who grew up having no idea what we wanted to do with our lives, Frank, with a small amount of help from his mom, knew early on. At a young age, Frank had a sense for his passion, his talent, and his future. It really was a a friend of mine down the street. His name was Gary Dorsey, (laughs) and he was like my best friend as a maybe first, second grader. And (laughs) he had a saxophone in his garage that I guess belonged to his mom. And I used to like to go over there and just kind of play with it, mess around with it. They let me borrow it for a while. And uh, I always liked it, but didn't really do too much with it. And then I started playing piano. I started playing guitar. Uh, But it really was like fourth, fifth grade band when you could kind of pick an instrument. Uh, My mom took me, uh, and the saxophone was the one that the the guy that was demonstrating all the instruments couldn't play. He played an oboe. uh, He played a trumpet. uh, He banged on like a marching drum. And then I thought the saxophone looked really, really cool, and he couldn't play it. So I thought that that was something that would be a fun challenge if if the guy that's being hired to present these things uh, couldn't play it and it just looked cool. Well, I love it that early on as a kid you wanted to show up your teacher. Like already you had big sights for yourself. It, it, it wasn't necessarily that because I really liked the teacher I ended up having. This person I thought was going to maybe be a teacher, but I guess he was just there to demonstrate and get people to rent instruments. So uh, that guy I don't mind showing up, but my teachers were all awesome and I have a a lot of respect for them, so I doubt that I'd ever be necessarily showing them up. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely a, a slight competitive nature is, has always been in me, I'll say that. And uh, I was also minorly interested in trying the tuba because I thought at like halftime football games, marching around seemed fun. And my mom was like, definitely do not go with the tuba. <laughs> but, <laughs> so my, it's That's good true. that my mom's here today because she definitely it's had true. a lot to do with. Uh, I could be in here right now with the tuba, <laughs> which would be about twice the size of uh, the studio almost. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm glad the saxophone worked out. And it wasn't just the saxophone that worked out. True to Frank's personable and upbeat nature, even as a young kid, he established long-standing relationships not just with his instrument, but with supporters and mentors alike. And this helped him to weather the ups and downs of life as an artist, which can sometimes mean long stints of no work and living paycheck to paycheck if you're lucky. I would say uh, by the time I was in junior high school, so maybe not like 10, but probably by the time I was 12 or 13. And you're totally right. A lot of people, you know, my mom was nervous for the reasons why you said, because we didn't have much money. But my thinking is, well, if you already don't have much money, you don't have anything to lose. <laughs> yes, <yeah. laughs> Roll the dice and come on, lucky seven. and see what happens. Um, but yeah, in all honesty, everything you said is totally accurate. I feel like I've been real fortunate because um, most of the things I've done seem to have been like long term things like um, Yamaha signed me to be like, you know, in their print ads and one of their endorsers and stuff in 2001. So that's been 15 years. Um, uh, the Reed Company, Diderio, I've been with them for at least 15 or so. Um, playing the Green Mill since I was, you know, a teenager, Andy's Jazz Club since I was a teenager. So it's like you're saying, there is a lot of hiring and firing and not always being, you know, you don't have the security of a regular job. But I feel like I've had a lot of security just in the fact that there's been a lot of long term relationships and places that I, I play all the time. Yamaha is always putting together festivals or clinics or, you know, things like that. And then uh, there's always awesome new people that come in and out 
Um, I brought you the bottle of Drambui and Drambui. I'm now uh, at least kind of their music spokesperson guy and most of their advertising. And they've put together a lot of awesome shows and have been really cool. Club Lucky, of course, has the Catalano yes. sidecar on the, yeah. the menu that we got to go have one of those maybe <laughs> tomorrow or something. I think would, good. would be fun. So, yeah, just uh, I feel so fortunate that it, uh, there's been a lot of cool people and long-standing relationships so it isn't every day you're looking for a new gig or whatnot i feel like pretty regularly there's uh you know streams of constant gigs coming in so i i do feel like i haven't quite had to go through that as much as other people have but definitely when you choose to be an artist you're doing it because you feel in your heart this is what you know god put me here for or if you don't believe in god this is my purpose you know whatever but you feel it in your heart like i have to do this and even even when people like my mom knew it would be tough, so in a loving way tried to talk me out of it, I was very stubborn and <laughs> didn't really listen. And 30 years later, here we are. Frank was on a shooting star trajectory, but then something happened. Something that would have stopped most of us in our tracks, but it made Frank really focus and hone in on playing the saxophone more than ever. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Chicago Stories will be right back after the break. Alfano. On this episode of Chicago Stories, saxophone player Frank Catalano tells us how he caught his big break, despite more than a few obstacles. Before the break, Frank was telling me about the exciting start to his career when he was just a teenager. But then, Frank had an accident. When most of us would have turned back, Frank got more serious than ever about playing the saxophone. When I was 16, I had just kind of started driving, and I had kind of fixed up a, a Volkswagen Beetle that I thought was really fun, and it wasn't running very well. And I was actually on my way to a very important uh, performance. I got out of school that day because I got picked as, like, I guess one of the best saxophone players in the country and to be part of the high school Grammy band. So I was all excited, and I... I thought that my little car would make it even though it was cold and uh I was trying to reach for the dipstick I shouldn't have turned I should have turned the engine off but my right middle finger I had a kind of a ratty glove on and it got sucked into the like generator belt and it ripped off my right middle finger so in addition to uh being very thankful that you know my finger <laughs> situation was put back on. A, a really great surgeon, Damien Gress, was able to uh, put it back on, and it, it was in a pin for many months, and even when the pin came out, it didn't really start working for some time. Uh, when nerves get damaged and everything, it can be a 
very slow process and anyone who's gone through it knows it's not very straightforward like one day everything seems like it wants to work but doesn't next day maybe you're telling your <laughs> your finger in this case to do something and it's not so um so not to mention that i lost a lot of blood and could have just you know not been here let alone uh, worrying about the finger, it's, you know, just maybe the fact that you could die because of how much blood you lose when something like that happens. So definitely uh, lucky that that, you know, worked itself out as far as having a, a great doctor and good th physical therapist and stuff. But uh, I did have to play that whole next year without being able to use my right middle finger. So I came up with a bunch of alternate fingerings using my index finger to do both of those keys uh, actually, two weeks ago, Hal Leonard Publishers uh, put out a saxophone instructional book that I wrote that I I talk about some of these things in, um, and uh, it kind of forced me to have my own technique for a while just because I was at a disadvantage of not, not only not having that finger usable, but to reconstruct that finger, they took out some... Uh, parts like underneath my thumb and that's the thumb you use to more or less hold the saxophone so my hand was very very compromised for some time now it works fine and everything worked like worked out like they had hoped but some stuff heals faster than they thought some stuff heals slower so I can only say that the tail end of my uh, high school uh, my junior and senior year not only was it exciting because I was playing a bunch of cool gigs with famous people and getting to do awesome stuff but the amount of healing and kind of relearning to play was uh, pretty intense. I asked Frank if this accident and the time spent healing and compensating for his middle finger made him doubt himself or made him think about backing off from the saxophone. No, I'm probably I'm probably too crazy and stubborn to I didn't get to that point uh, of doubting myself, but the the level of frustration was huge. I'd say that because one day things would be going well, and then the next day maybe you accidentally bump your finger and you don't have much feeling in it cuz the nerves haven't fully grown back, but it's functioning. I remember one time I thought my finger was, you know, going to be okay and I had stopped using my index finger to do both keys and then I was at a, a concert that was kind of important and my finger did nothing but spasm the whole time I would say for about two hours like it just was spasming so I then had to revert to using my index finger for both while my middle finger is just freaking out and spasming so there is there is a, a just a level of you kind of like have to Jedi Knight like focus beyond belief and just uh, make the stuff happen to the best of your ability. So that, so I would definitely say never doubted myself, but there was quite a bit, bit of frustration along the way, that's for sure. Frank doesn't just play the sax. He also writes and composes original music. When I asked him about his creative process, he expressed so many thoughts at once on the various ways he creates music that it is easy to understand that he is both prolific and committed. Even just speaking about music makes him excited, his words almost popping. I definitely always loved writing songs, and I wrote a lot of uh, songs in high school and college, and my degree from DePaul University is in classical composition. So I've, you know, written, you know, things for, you know, 110-piece orchestras and film scoring things, as well as uh, songs that I like to play, you know, in my own group, just with the four or five of us. And um, I would have to say, uh, when I'm writing stuff for, uh, you know, my band, uh, I I usually like to have some type of little melody, an idea, something kind of spark, uh, you, make me passionate about continuing, meaning it could be a bass line. My Mighty Burner song, uh, I, I named that after Charles Erland, great uh, B3 organ player I used to play with. Um, and I heard the bass line, and it's like... So for some reason, I just heard like that bass part, and I always remember him playing the B3 where you're walking the bass in your left hand and you're playing the chords and the, the melodies in your right hand. So it just made me think of him, and that's a song where I actually wrote the bass part first, and then I wrote the actual melody, which is more of like a counter melody to go with the bass part. So I don't have uh, any set 
a way of of writing. It's more like inspirational. But if somebody asks me, can you put some music to this film score? Uh, my friend Jim Cornelison that sings the anthem for the Blackhawks. I just finished kind of producing his record. Was in the studio with him all day Monday. So like when he has a specific request, then it's different. You have to maybe not go on. Uh, an emotional thing so much as you have to use learned knowledge, I would say, uh, to, you know, make stuff come to fruition. So I would say it's about 50-50 practice, dedication, I guess like a third a third, practice, dedication, and uh, just being excited uh, and having something pop into your head. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Chicago Stories will be right back after the break and news. Elizabeth Alfano. On this episode of Chicago Stories, saxophone player Frank Catalano tells us about the start of his career when he was only a teenager, playing in bars and clubs around town. About the time I started high school, uh, I started meeting a lot of people that were great musicians. I started playing uh, just outside of Chicago a little uh, place in Evanston called Bistro 1800 that was right across the street from Northwestern University. And I met so many nice Chicago musicians uh, that maybe lived in Evanston or taught at the university. Um, We had a rehearsal space for a rock band I was in called International Hoodwink um, on uh, Division, about 1800 West Division. And it was a more, uh, I would say, rugged neighborhood back then because this would have been like maybe 1990 or so, so 25, 26 years ago. It was definitely, uh, um, you know, interesting because you would maybe come out uh, of the rehearsal space and, you know, somebody would be driving me and... um, They'd be like, oh, man, my car has been broken into again and, you know, that type of stuff, which also is is interesting because it gives you a sense of urgency, I think, with your music. You, when you're in an, an urban setting like Chicago that is so uh, diverse, eclectic, inspiring, energetic, it, it brings things out in your music. Uh, the band uh, International Hoodwink, we opened for so many uh, great bands at the Metro. Uh, I remember specifically uh, a band called Velocity Girl that we opened for, and I just remember thinking, I'm 14 years old, and uh, the Metro is right across from Wrigley Field, and it's a unique and very cool vibrant area to begin with but to be in uh, an awesome place like the metro opening up for internationally touring bands it, it was so exciting for me and it made me uh really really want to hone my skills on the saxophone even more uh i i quickly and had already felt but i had quickly felt by the time i was 14 that jazz was going to be my path more so than rock and pop music although Uh, I still love playing all types of music. It was very clear early on that Frank was an incredible talent. But even the most talented among us needs a mentor, needs some inspiration, and has to dodge a bullet or two. Uh, It was about the time that I was 14 that I was really making a point to go to Von Freeman's jazz sessions uh, at the new apartment lounge on East 75th Street. Uh, I remember my friend Mark Nagy bringing me there 
Uh, definitely lots of musicians wanting to sit in with Vaughn. One time, somebody was was drunk and had a gun on them and fell, and it accidentally went off, and they shot themselves. Um, it, it, if you weren't there, you you I feel like. Uh, I don't want to say you missed out. I mean, that is how I feel, but it's not that so much as I feel really lucky to have been a part of that because sitting in with Vaughn and learning from him and meeting so many other musicians uh, was amazing. Uh, this, that section of East 75th Street is named after Vaughn Freeman. He has an honorary uh, street designation there. Uh, it was also about that time that I would say on a weekly basis I was hanging out with Vaughn Freeman both on his house uh, at his house that was just south of there uh, at the jam sessions but also uh, you know going to Andy's Jazz Club to sit in with him. Uh, I actually met him for the first time. My dad took me to Andy's Jazz Club when I was about 10 or 11. I would have been like end of fifth grade going into sixth grade. So I had only been playing saxophone for a short amount of time, but I had actually been asked uh, to play like with the the chorus at uh, school. And I'd already done several performances with like kind of 50s, 60s R&B songs, uh, Junior Walker Shotgun, um, Rock and Robin, the Jackson 5 version. So I had already done some playing, and it was so inspiring to meet Vaughn at a young age. And then, uh, you know, uh, just shortly after, get to really be sitting in at his jam sessions a lot. And it was around, I would say, that time, because I would have been 14 or 15, uh, Miles Davis played at the Chicago Jazz Festival, uh, I believe it was 1990 Jazz Festival, and Von Freeman was playing um, at the Jazz Bowls on Lincoln, not too far from DePaul University in Lincoln, uh, uh, Lincoln Park area. And I got to go in and sit in with Von, and then Miles Davis walks in and takes out his trumpet and sits in with us. I can't tell you how scared I was and excited. Frank has played with jazz and music greats from around the world, from David Sanborn to backing up groups like Destiny's Child. But he learned something very particular the night he played with Miles Davis at the age of 14. As a performer, you have to get over fear really quickly. And if you're 14 years old and playing with your idols that are such legends, there's no way that you can have fear because you wouldn't get on stage but it also if somebody is a i think a solid human being they, they'll also be like very quickly like humbled and realize this is so special so i i can tell you more than anything that that specific experience with miles davis but already having kind of formed this true almost like grandfather type relationship with von it, it made me uh, really appreciate not only being a musician, but the interaction you get from other musicians, but also while you have to be respectful to everybody, you also have to have the courage to sometimes say things you don't, uh, if you don't like something. Uh, sometimes you say them with your saxophone or in a musical way, uh, with the way you kind of assert yourself or maybe jump in after a solo. Sometimes you say it after the performance. Sometimes it's just a matter of letting your mind zone out and blank out so you can let, um, if if you want to call it divine intervention, if you want to call it a uh, spiritual feeling, but some, a lot of times that will enter you. And I sure felt it like for the first time for real that night because you you have to be good enough to perform, even though I wasn't, a, you know, a great saxophone player at age 14. I was very good for a 14-year-old. And I remember specifically Von Freeman always, you know, complimented me and was really nice and always said how fiery I played. And uh, I guess him, Miles Davis and Von uh, talked for a minute after and Von came up and said, you know, how complimentary he was. I only said two words to him and he just kind of like gave me a nod. So it's not like we had uh, some long term friendship or not. But still, that's an experience that I know I, I I couldn't have gotten. I don't think in any other city and in any other way. So things were going well for Frank. Jazz legend Von Freeman had taken him under his wing and he had avoided getting shot.
literally. All while being a teenager, playing in bars where he wasn't even old enough to drink. Just when things got good for Frank, they then got even better. Excitable as ever, Frank was enthusiastic and prepared. I pretty quickly uh, had a bunch of great things happen. Uh, my mom took me to hear uh, organ player Charles Erland. I had heard him on the radio, and I wanted to at least hear his music. And uh, we went to Andy's. I would have been uh, end of high school, early college uh, at DePaul University, so I would have been about 18 years old, uh, maybe still 17. And uh, I asked Charles Zerlin if I could sit in with him, and I brought my saxophone because the voice in the back of my head is like, you probably <laughs> you should bring your saxophone that night. And he's like, oh, no, kid, that's okay. Uh, my saxophone player will show up. And his saxophone player didn't show up, so towards the end of the night, he called me up and asked me to play with him. And I thought it was just going to be for one song. He called like a 12-bar blues. Then he called some other songs that I didn't know, but I could hear uh, the chords well, and he liked my soloing. Then he ended with his kind of signature song, More Today Than Yesterday, and asked me for my phone number at the end of the evening. And that led to, I don't know how many, probably seven or 800 gigs, multiple recording sessions, and the owner of... Uh, Andy's Jazz Club, Scott Chisholm was there and started asking me to play there, which was so nice of him. And then also uh, Bob Kester, who owns Delmark Records, who is a Chicago legend in and of himself, but Delmark Records is over 60 years old now. Uh, Buddy Guy, Junior Wells, so many, Sun Ra, so many famous people have been signed to Delmark. And Bob Kester heard me playing that night and gave me his card and said, keep in touch. He really liked my playing. So uh, he did not sign me <laughs> that night. He waited until uh, about six months. Uh, I would say we met about four times before he actually signed me to Delmark Records. He came to hear me at the Green Mill again, and it was the 80th birthday party for Joe Dano, who used to own the Bucket of Suds, which was a very infamous uh, restaurant, lounge, bar at, that I miss very much because that's not you know around anymore. Or is Joe Dano, and he was so cool. Definitely a Chicago legend. And uh, it was that night, uh, Joe Dano on the microphone with Dave Gemelo, owner of the Green Mill, uh, next to him said that how much he loved my playing and that I would be the future of jazz, basically. And Bob Kester came up to me and said, well, Joe Dano's uh, a, a total aficionado, you know, was friends with Louis Armstrong, knew all these people. And if he likes you, then I guess I better sign you, kid. And I was like, OK. But it almost didn't happen. A twist of fate occurred. And for a moment, it looked like Frank wasn't going to get signed at all. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Chicago Stories will be right back after the break. Elizabeth Alfano. On this episode of Chicago Stories, saxophone player Frank Catalano tells us how he caught his big break, despite a rough patch or two. Before the break, Frank was telling me about how he was just about to get signed to Delmark Records. But then, disaster struck, and for a moment, Frank thought he had lost his big chance. 
So he says, come to my office at 5 o'clock tomorrow. I'm like, great. So I was a freshman at DePaul University. I drove my car to the music school. Did not, was all excited, so nervous, could barely get through the, the day of classes because I was, uh, my heart was beating so fast. And I, I was just so excited that I was being offered uh, a, a really quality record deal. It's, it, it's like, you know, winning the lottery slash more because this is something you're so passionate about and you just love. And I go back to my car and it's not there. And I'm like, uh oh. What happened? Did I just, like, space out? So I'm walking down Belden. I'm at, like, Sheffield and Belden at this point by the music building, and I didn't know what to do. I walked back to my dorm room. Uh, I actually uh, called and reported my car stolen, although it was a junky car, so I didn't know why somebody would want to steal it. And then when I was talking, I'm uh, the, the police officer said, do you think it might have been towed? And I'm like, well, I don't think so. And he's like, yeah, there's a lot of cut curbs over there. So we tow cars a lot. I didn't know what a cut curb was, but it's just kind of like in the middle of the street, the curve kind of uh, curb dips. And it doesn't really make sense because it's not like at a crosswalk necessarily. But at any rate, long story short, my car was towed. I was freaked out. I borrowed money from everybody in my dorm room to go get it back. And then I drove over to the Delmark offices, which uh, were 4121 Rockwell, still there, like Irving and Rockwell. I, I was truly getting on my car as Bob Kester was walking out. He's like, I never thought you'd get here. I have the contract in my briefcase. I got Steve Wagner with me. Let's go to dinner. So it worked out perfect, but I can tell you that's a day. I will never forget, and for sure, um, uh, something that I can say wouldn't have happened anywhere but Chicago, that's for sure. Frank is definitely a Chicago son, and we talked about whether Chicago has had an influence on him as a musician or has shaped his music in any way. Definitely. Uh, I mean, my wife and I still, you know, uh, have Chicago as our home. You know, we own a home in Bucktown. We did buy a place this year in New York, but Chicago will always be our home and our uh, where my heart is. Uh, definitely without Chicago, I don't think my career would be uh, where it is now. And I'm very thankful that everything is going the way it is. And I'm certainly thankful for having grown up in Chicago. I asked Frank why he thinks his albums Love Supreme Collective, Bye Bye Blackbird, and God's Gonna Cut You Down, to name a few, have all topped Billboard and iTunes charts. I thought it maybe has something to do with Frank being such a great businessman. He is dedicated to social media and promotion and truly gives his music every chance for extra exposure. Like always, Frank was humble and modest, despite his many accolades. I don't think of myself at all as a business person. Uh, my wife, Sona, always is complimentary to me. She thinks I'm a good business person. Sona's a good business person. Uh, so it, I take that as a compliment, but I, I don't really even think about it because every day I'm playing something somewhere, I'm performing, I'm working on a, a new album, I'm doing a TV show, I'm doing a radio show like we're doing that's fun. And uh, so I think uh, constantly doing uh, creative things that you really love, uh, it, it while it turns out to be good in a business way, I've never even thought about it that way because it's it's a fun and b I'm always meeting different people and obviously the concerts and stuff you know make the mortgage payment happen like so you you should be doing them anyway but it's fun so it's a win win. The one thing that I guess I always feel is if it's something that you feel passionate about and if you love it. And if in, like, your gut feeling this is the right thing to do, then it's probably going to be a good business decision. If it's something that you're questioning and you don't feel comfortable with it, I really think the few times that I've maybe not made great decisions, uh, maybe signed to a record deal, in one case with one record company that I was already kind of questioning to begin with, uh, it turned out to not be a good situation. So I think if in a, you know, your gut, if it's not a good thing in your gut, it's probably not a good thing for real life. To end today's show, here is a rendition of a Duke Ellington song, Morphing into a Christmas Song, played by Frank Catalano. This week's feature on Chicago Stories. Let, let's play something fun. I think uh, I think that'd be good. Seeing all the 
the fun Christmas lights on Michigan Avenue, I think maybe something Christmassy. And last night at the Green Mill, I got a bunch of requests to play some Duke Ellington. So maybe Duke Ellington's things ain't what they used to be. And Oh Christmas Tree kind of as a, a little med- medley of sorts. Sounds wonderful. Cool. Take it away. <laughs> Alfano, Chicago Stories creator and host. Lead producer is Paul Velazquez, with help from producers Joshua Snyder, Kevin Richter, and Mike Heideman. For more information, visit catalanomusic.com and my website, thedinnerparty.tv. And if you have a Chicago story that you would like to share, send me an email at elizabeth at thedinnerparty.tv.